direct from the web, it's Billy Masters Live. And now, please welcome your host, Billy Masters. Hello, everybody. We don't have everything working. Oh, my God. Look at that. I've frozen again. Oh, for fuck's sake. It's okay. That I can fix, I think. Okay. First, I, I just, just taken myself, myself out of one browser. I've got four browsers going at the same time. Uh, hello. Oh, my God. This is just nightmarish. We haven't had a show like this. David, are you hearing me at all? I am only seeing your lips moving, but I'm not seeing anything. But we are so close. We are so close to figuring this out. Uh, let. Okay, are you hearing me now? Okay, good. Guys, you're in the alternate camera, but uh, welcome to Billy Masters Live. I am Billy Masters, and we are going to figure this out. So let me explain what happened. David and I were talking, and everything was fine. Then you weren't able to see or hear us, and we were thinking, oh, there's a problem with Facebook. There's a problem with YouTube. Well, when I said I think I figured it out, that's because a message came on the software screen that said, there is a problem with StreamYard. Please reboot uh, your browser. And so I did reboot the browser, and then everything was fine. So, but then everything just froze, which doesn't thrill me. Let me just explain that to you. So now I've rebooted the main computer. Okay, hold on a second. Hello. Okay, I've rebooted the main computer. Now, here's the problem with this. The Bluetooth has to be reconnected. <laughs> and, of course, we've got this crazy brightness on my screen. But that's okay, guys. You will get to see and hear us momentarily. I swear to you. Now, first, I have to turn off the Bluetooth. And then I've got to reboot the boot Bluetooth. Can I just tell you the irony of all of this is that David and I were just talking about how we are not built for all of this crappy technology piece of shit, Bastion stuff. Um, I don't know if I've got Bluetooth working or not, but um, we are going to continue nonetheless. Um, anyway, and obviously we should fix this um my zooming and things should be better and my lighting you know you would not believe this but a minute ago when david and i were talking backstage i had the best lighting that i've ever had on this show anyway we are starting with the personal anecdote even whether we can get things working or not and the personal anecdote look the lighting's already getting better and the zoom will be fixed in a minute there you go. Look at, and then I just got to tilt it a little bit and boom, we got a show. Okay. So I'm not sure uh, you're fine. Well, thank you, Larry Blum. Your standards are far lower than mine, but I appreciate it. Nonetheless, I'm going to give myself just a little bit more color because you know, it was indigenous people day yesterday. Oh, you know why? They go, Oh my God. Now I got too much color. I'm like wheezy on the Jeffersons. Okay. Look at that. It's like a real show. If only I could hear myself. But that's okay. Hearing is uh, very overrated. And I can plug myself into the other computer and listen there. So fuck all of you. So anyway, personal anecdote. Look at this. I'm putting a wire in because I don't care. Kenny will complain, but that's all right. Um, personal anecdote. Um, I just looked through some pictures and I was thinking of something that made me laugh. Oh, by the way, uh, because I didn't say at the beginning of the show, today is Tuesday, October 13th, 2020. And uh, thank you for being for us with us on Billy Masters Live. Um, even if we're not really live, I mean, we're kind of live. Anyway, personal anecdote. I just found this picture which made me laugh. And I admit, Doris Roberts, I don't remember what this was. I think it might have been an Emmy Awards, but I don't show. 
Anyway, I'd met Doris many times, but I never took a picture with her. And then when people start getting to a certain age, you start thinking to yourself, I should get a picture before they die. So I was walking out of the Emmys and I saw Doris and I said, can we take a picture? And my friend Freddie clicked this quick picture. And it wasn't until I got the picture developed that I saw the guy in the background. Now, I believe the guy on her right is having a stroke. And I don't care because he's in the way of my picture. And yet Freddie seemed compelled to get the guy with the stroke in his picture. Doris is dead. I'm guessing the guy in the picture is also dead. Anyway, that's just all. It just made me laugh a little bit for no reason. Um, now, this uh, delay is going to really annoy me. So I know uh, how I can fix this. But the best way to fix it is to do this one thing. So hold on one second, people. Um, oh, but let, while I'm doing this, and if I take this out of my ear, I can actually tell you the story without being um, annoyed by double sound. Okay, good. Device disconnected. Go to hell. Who cares? Um, so I am very excited, aside from today's show, which of course excites me, is that on Thursday, and if this happens on Thursday, then the show is completely over because we will never be able to do this show with um, the problems that we've had today. But on um Thursday show, you know, you don't get a lot of legends on your show. At least I don't. And on Thursday, I have a legend. I have Ed Asner is going to be on this show. So um, you will not want to miss that show because uh, I've got a ton of questions for Ed. And uh, it is just going to be uh, one of the best shows we've ever done. And I say that as if it will really happen, but I'm hoping it will really happen. So uh, anyway, make sure you tune in for that show. Now, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to hear our guest, so I've got the other headphones there. But let's see when I bring him in what happens. Let me welcome my guest, David Pepsner. Hey. Oh, my God, I hear you in my ear. I don't hear me, but I hear you. Okay, that's okay. fine. How are you, David? Thank you for this. This has been oh a my little God, we've been through, through hell, haven't we? We have, and my lighting isn't as good as it was, and I don't dare touch it. I think it looks um, good. Oh, look! There and, you go. There you go. And it just took sorry, you look like, like you have life, and I look like I'm faded and and. Uh, but I'm alive. I'm healthy. Here we are. You know, thank God. Can I just tell you how good it makes me feel to see you? Because um. I would see you more often if we were in LA. I would at least bump into you someplace. I know. The only time I see you is on your show. I know. And the only time I see you, can I tell you, I'm just playing with my tilting, so don't mind me. Um, okay. okay, there we go. Now we're kind of the same height. Your head is bigger. Not the first time you've heard that. Okay. Um, uh, cool. But we'll get to that in a minute. Oh, now my <laughs> head is like monstrously big. I look like Mothra. You know, like when you see Mariah Carey kind of tiptoe on stage in a dress that's five sizes too small and she can barely walk. That's how I feel right now. Oh, okay. Um, but okay. then she anyway. goes out there and gives it. So Okay, but there you go. I'm fine now. Okay, guys, we're, the show is just beginning now. I should play the music again. Oh, forget it. Okay. And we're done. Um, I am thrilled to have David Pevsner here because David Pevsner, first off, we go back. Well, I've been in L.A. 22 years. Right. So, well, but I knew you before. I, I knew you when I was in New York, didn't I? You know, I'm I? not sure, but we didn't get close until L.A. I yeah, think I we met in New York. Uh, when did you move to L.A.? 98. So it's pretty much oh, the wow. same. Yeah. Mm. When were you in my apartment? Do you remember? Oh, God, that was like four apartments in when I had been subletting and jumping around, you know. I would probably say probably around 2000. Yeah, maybe, because I've been there a couple of years. I, I moved. I you know, what? I think I was doing When Pigs Fly, which was um, uh, end of 99 for like, I don't know, six months or eight months or something. 
Yeah, maybe. I'm trying. I anyway, it's all seems a blur. I feel like I've known you forever. And I um went through your show last night. And first off, I um have to say, uh, I'm just typing something in so I can pull up the uh, screenshot of the show, which, of course, has miraculously disappeared because, you know, that's what happens. OK, here we go. We're saving it. Um, David has this show called Musical Comedy Whore. David, is the name still Musical Comedy Whore? Because every time I talk to you, yeah. something happens with the name. Oh my God. So we were, you know, so the, it's the filmed version of the show. We filmed the show live. Which Everything he had toured well. around the country and then filmed it in place. Burbank at the Colony Theater. Right. So we did a one night a film shoot of it. And um, finally it, it was ready to come out. September 1st was the road, the big rollout. You know, it's going to be on Amazon and Hulu, uh, not Hulu, Amazon and Fandango and, and all these things. We're right. so excited. And then like the day before, I think August 31st, Amazon decided that the title needed to be censored. And so let that, us show them. So here's the main artwork, musical right. comedy whore. Right. And, um, so, and they didn't, want, what was the problem? Well, it's funny because the word whore, although my friend said, it's probably because musical comedy offended them. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I, because of the word whore, but what's crazy about, about Amazon, and none of the other ones had a problem with it. But what's crazy about it is there's a film on Amazon available with Teresa Russell called Whore. Okay. Yes, I remember that film. Yes. Well, here's what here's what happened. Here's what it finds. And so it's finally, it wasn't until this past week where it all got worked out. And what is it, October now? Uh, yeah, and it was supposed to be what middle of September? September first was when oh, it was. Oh God! Be. Okay. It was like this big roll, and then this happened, which kind of took the the wind out of the sails a little bit. You, you know? were booked here. You were booked here before, and we had to delay it. Right, right. So now what happened is it's available everywhere, but if you go to Amazon Pay Per View, Amazon Prime Pay Per View, you have mm -hmm. to look for it as musical comedy stud because we have to change the title. For, for but Doug. on Amazon, regular Amazon, to buy it, it's still buy the DVD, it's still it's still musical comedy horror. But if you're gonna and everywhere else, it's musical comedy horror. Google Play. David, uh, you know, can we just petition somebody, please? The problem is that it's all done like uh, by, by by bots. There's no human. So can you even talk, talk to anybody? No, you oh, can't. You just think. Whatever the case, I mean, it's awful because you can't just go, hey, watch my movie. It's like, watch my movie. But if you watch it on Amazon, you got to call. It's insane. Right. But hopefully right. people will find it. Just put my name and musical comedy if you have to Google. Actually, if you go to musicalcomedyhorror.com and click yep. on how to watch, that is a link to everywhere you can oh, get. You didn't tell me that link. Okay, I'll oh, put sorry. that up too. Musical comedy, what is it? Com. Oh, comedy whore.com. Yep. And click on how to watch all okay. the links. All you got to do is click on it. Okay, Monica, Monica, put the link up right now. Okay, there it is. Okay. Thank you. Musical comedy whore.com. Okay. And thank you. Click on how to watch, and it'll literally link you anywhere you want to go. You know, uh -huh. you can watch it on your cable box. It's available on, you know, Spectrum. Oh, cable. really? For, for, um, for, uh, is it like the streaming? Yeah. Yeah. Lots of streams. Wow. Hope you'll watch. Well, can I just tell you, I um, I've seen it live. Oh my god, three, maybe three times. I think I'm not sure. And then, uh, no, please. And uh, and then I saw. Well, a couple times I remember surprising you, because I didn't tell. Because I'm never quite sure where I'm going to be. Because anything can happen, apparently. Yeah. And um, and um. One of the times you're like, well, you didn't tell me you were coming. I'm like, yeah, well, I didn't know. Um, but then I watched it again. I watched part of it last night and I watched the second half of it today. And, um, you know, every time I see it and maybe because we're very close in age, you're just like a smidge older than me. And um, we went through the same experiences. We were in New York around the same time. We were in LA the same time we discovered sex. I, I was going to just say I was never a hooker, but I'll just say, but you'll hear about that in my book or my show. But um, you, you were for, certainly more of a hooker and certainly more successful hooker than I was. If I were a hooker. Yeah. Dia, dia, dum. Yeah. Um, <laughs>
Gotta go for I found this yeah. video that made me laugh. So I want to just take you back, David. David, this is a little blast from your past, just so people know the journey. Look at this, kid. Hi, I'm David Pevsner, and I'm here in Rancho Mirage to perform the world premiere of my new one-man musical, Musical Comedy Horror. Now, the title alone should get you in here. The show is all about sex. It's all fun. It's very funny, and I promise you, you'll have a great time. So please come on down to the Desert Rose Playhouse for the world premiere of Musical Comedy Horror. Who's laying there? <laughs> oh how long ago is that david it wasn't even that long ago that's 2013 it's only seven years ago and look at this now oh my god uh, okay now my video has frozen but don't, nobody fear i'm still here it will come back eventually um i know i know we'll hold on back. hold on we'll you will back. you will hold on a second okay i'm seeing you so that's okay um so how many years ago was that that was 2013 and what's funny about it is you know, I'm talking about the musical and I'm kind of talking around the subject matter a little bit because I went through the period where I was like, I don't really want to reveal, it's a reveal in the show about me becoming a hooker. But that, so at the time I was kind of very quiet about it. Plus there was something about standing, like, telling anybody, hey, I was a hooker. Um, but over the years, I, it, you know, the whole show has kind of, taken on a whole different resonance. And though, even though it is about this period in my life where I was a male escort while doing high profile off-Broadway theater, so I was literally a musical comedy whore. It's not just, I think people think by the title, it's some cute little vanity production where I'm like, hey, look what I did. And it's not, it was a, such, a, there's so much that resonated within me and with people like guys our age, especially, but women, I mean, I have found everybody go, look, I didn't have your experiences. I never went through that. But I have something similar in my life, being judged about your choices, you know, taking ownership of your choices. It's all mm -hmm. this stuff. That, as I've done the show more and more, I have found that the audience, no matter who they are, gay, straight or whatever, kind of goes, oh, my God, that's so weird that I identify with this guy. But I totally do, you know. And, you know, I think, you know, uh so for people who don't know you and um and and probably most don't um you started out in skoka i know i'm sorry um if, if it's any consolation most of the people watching saying who the hell is billy masters um <laughs> is that like your like your song uh naked maid said you grew up in skokie illinois correct yep well, Perky Little Porn Star is the song that, oh, that Perky, is that where it is? Yeah, Perky that, Little Porn Star. It. Yeah, but no. And I come um, from and you were you were a little um, little gay boy, little gay Jew boy. I mean, that's the other thing, and it's so funny because I don't, you know, I suppose I look at you and I know you're Jewish, and I've spent time with you, and I know you're Jewish, but I don't look at you and think, oh, that's a Jew. But it was a big part of your childhood, how you identified yourself and how you felt others saw you. Yeah, it's funny when people ask if I'm a Jew, I say, well, I'm Jewish, you know. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, it was one of those things, you know, I went to Hebrew school. I was this, I was a nice Jewish boy. I was really smart and I did theater and I did all this stuff. But, you know, when you're gay and you're not talking about it and you hold it in, there's this shame that kind of grows within you and it becomes a darkness. And so underneath that nice Jewish boy, there was always this desire to act out sexually, to explore mm -hmm. things that I never thought I would, which is again, the, the uh, journey of the film, you know, where the nice Jewish right. boy kind of taps into his darkness a little bit and what it does to me for the good and the bad. Um, you know, I'm and curious when I was watching it and I was thinking to myself, if you, I don't want to say had integrated all of those parts earlier, but maybe I do. Maybe that's the best way of saying it, that, you know, didn't have the shame because there's a whole section about things you were ashamed of, is that if you didn't have that shame, would it have driven you to get the attention in musical theater and other things? It's so hard to say because uh, as it's kind of the theme of the show is that you are a sum of, of every experience you've ever had. So you can't right. say what would have happened if I took that if I didn't do that because you did and it's and right. it may 
you know, you might have gone in a much more negative direction. Everything leads up to who you are today. And, and the hope right. is that. And one thing affects everything. Yeah, exactly. So you can't really, I, I guess you could kind of guess what would happen. But for me, if I had not had so much shame growing up, if I, I probably would still have explored what I wanted to because just because even if I was comfortable with my sexuality, that doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. mean I would become a hooker, you know, or not. Well, that's true. It's something that I, that deep down inside, you know, hooker, uh, exploring sexuality on film and stuff, stuff that inside I always wanted to, but I was either too afraid or too, um, uh, you know, afraid of what it might do to my reputation and my career and blah, blah, all that shit, which I don't give a crap about anymore because I think that, I think that the way we look at sex in America is shitty. There's so right. much shame attached to it. And I am on a mission for people to like, stop judging your own sexuality, stop judging your, your love for fetish, stop judging other people for what they do sexual. Oh, like, Oh, I would never do that. No. Maybe you wouldn't do it, but don't judge them for doing it. You know, it, it's this whole mission that I'm on now. Well, blah, I think blah, blah, blah. that, you know, well, no, I, I agree with you. And I think that you also talk about the fact that you were really looking at yourself through your formative years, through the mm -hmm. eyes of everyone around you, rather than totally. through your own eyes. Totally. I mean, when, you know, again, when you grow up, so, and I, I had a great, my family was great. You know, my parents were great, very supportive of stuff, but there were just things you didn't talk about, you know, and those were the things that were kind of eating away inside of me. And so, you know, it's, it's so layered. I mean, I, I, I mean, I hate to sound, say that my show is so layered, but there really is a lot. Well, it it's, is. Almost it's almost epic in, in the journey that I went on, which so many people have gone on in their own way. I worked it out a different way than maybe you did, but right. we all had to. But not really. <laughs> well, <laughs> there is universality in all these shows. Um, I have a friend that when I will hear particularly one person shows, whether it's about the person performing it or whether they're embodying a person like, you know, FDR, Ed Asner has toured playing FDR. And mm. somebody might say, well, what do I care about Ed Asner? Or what do I care about FDR? But I love seeing one person shows, even about somebody I've never heard of, because there's always something, if it's well done, there's something you can connect with. And actually, even when it's not well done. Well, you know, it's funny. When, right before I did this, the show for the first, when, was it this show? No, my very first one man show, I was to Bitter and Back. And I was visiting New York before I actually did it. But I was in rehearsal for it. And I was sitting that at the That would be this show. That's that show. Yes. Thank you. Still stores working. Okay, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> I love that graphic. Yeah, you're, you're on it. You are on it. Wow. So I, remember, I remember I was visiting New York and I was at the Big Cup. I was waiting for my best friend, Andy, to show up. And I'm sitting mm -hmm. there and these two little guys, one, one guy is sitting there, this young, young, cute twink boy. And another one comes in with this pile of papers. And he sits down, he plops the papers down. I'm literally I'm sitting right next to him at the table, you know, the big tables. And he goes, I just got the flyers for my one man show. And I was like, oh, I'm doing a one-man show, too. And I look at the flyers, and what they were was the, the, the paper kind of went like this because mm -hmm. on each of the papers, he had stapled a, a Polaroid. Like, that was instead of, like, printing what, them What, then it, like, popped up? You know, no, there was, like, you know how when you have a pack of papers, but you, you yeah. put more? So there's photos here, so they made the photos. Oh, okay. They made the pile yep. look like that. And mm -hmm. I kind of looked over, and on it, there were, there were various – he was kind of going like this – and this, and, yeah. and, and the show was called, It's About Me. And I went, holy shit. I hope I didn't write It's About Me. Like <laughs> when you do the one day show, you know, you, what I found with that show and this show, and I did a did lot Did you of see workout. It's About Me? I did not, I wasn't in New York long enough. Oh. I was just visiting, I would have killed. But yeah. what I learned from that, and what maybe that kid, maybe he had it and understood it younger than I did. When you do a one-man show, there is an element of, hey, look what I did, and mm -hmm. look how I did my life. But you've got to find out why it's resonant to anybody. Like if, if, if somebody who would like not be interested in David Pevsner or musical comedy or horror, why is it that that guy would love my show? And when you yeah. find the universal resonance, then it doesn't feel so. It's about me. It feels more like well, you it's know, about us. 
you know, I remember uh, Nia Vardalis started my Big Fat Greek Wedding as a one-person show at the Old Globe, which was by my apartment. And oh. um, one of the things that I remember she said in an interview, because I would have gone because I'm of Albanian descent. It's like Greek. So, you know, but I thought to myself, I'm going for this reason. But how many Greeks or Albanians are there? But when in, in the interview, she had said she found the more specific she got, the more universal it became because Everybody yeah. has that specificity. And when you try to make it general, you lose any relevance. Absolutely. And so I think there, there's something really powerful about that. It, it, and, you know, for her, it, it wasn't just about being Greek. Like, it was about Had family. Had nothing to do with it. Right. It's about family. And everyone you know, has a family. And, and if they're any ethnicity, they all can identify with it. Maybe if they're we all have waspy, maybe. But, yeah. You know, when I was doing Fiddler, I did Fiddler on the Roof on Broadway and on tour. And we we went to Japan with it. And we were like, mm -hmm. why are we going to Japan with Fiddler on the Roof? Why would they have <laughs> in this Jew show? You know, why? And it turns out because it's about family and tradition. Mm -hmm. And Jap right. Japan, you know, the Japanese are all about family and tradition. It's the most popular music that musical that had ever played Japan. So when oh, you wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. And if you're at, at the time, it was. And if you're if you're just thinking like, well, they're not going to want to see a show where a bunch of you know we're all wearing like prayer shawls and going like this. Why would the Japanese people want to see that? It's because that's not what it's about. it's not about that. It's about right. family and tradition. And so and a journey. You, it's a and the journey and it's a journey that like you could watch it and identify with it for anybody who's had a family or anybody who lives their life by any kind of tradition. It's sometimes it, right. that's the generality, you know. But for right. my show. It's like you know, my sister said, you know, she didn't want to see a show about my sex life. And yes, Probably. there's stuff about my sex life <laughs> in it, but it's very universal stuff. We all developed sexually growing up and we all had our fears and stuff. So that part of the show, I think, is very funny and relatable. And then right. as well, it it's actually on, presented non-threateningly, I will say. And, and not judgmentally, you know, so that you can watch it and go. Oh wow! I did that too. Strange that I, again that I'm strangely identifying with this guy who took this journey. Um, I really appreciate right. that because I I think people sometimes think when they see the poster or they don't know me very well, they think this is some cute little vanity show. You know, like why well, do I as many as many one man shows are. I mean, the reason that that worked on Will and Grace with just Jack was that that's all. It's all about me. You know, I mean, we know those shows. Right. That's a funny, that is a very, yeah, funny trope, but that's not, you know, it's, I, I feel like there's a road for me to get people to, to watch this show because they think, you know, sometimes, and one man shows, you may love them, but some people are like, uh, Oh no, people, I, my best friend hates them. And he's yeah. like, unless I know the person and like the person, why do I want to go? Right. So I got to get past that. And I got to get past people thinking this is. And there is going to be them. that bias from that segment of the audience. And it is what it is. Absolutely. But now I'm working. Now that we have them all out there, now that you can get your DVDs and you can get your streaming, now comes the work of making people go like, you know, and, and we need conduit -y type people. We need like, you know, I need my Rita Wilson who, who right. saw. Who um, saw my, it. Greek wedding and then turned it into a film. And why that. did she go? Because she's Greek. Because I mean, you know, I, I'm sorry to say, but that is why she went. And Absolutely. had had Tom Hanks not been married to a Greek woman, Nia Vardalis would be on this show. <laughs> you could still have <laughs> love to be there. I could. I like uh, Nia, Nia and I if I, but, you know, she could be David Bevsner. <laughs> sorry, Nia. Um, so I'm going to go back to the beginning of your life. Now, God help me. I'm going to try to run a clip. So if I lose you, just hang with me. Oh, wow. But, um. Uh, hopefully anybody who's gay has gone through this experience when they were young and God help us. At six years old, I was using my pillow for passionate romantic trysts with TV actors as I watched 25 hours of TV a day. So even before I knew what sex was, most of my early fantasies revolved around fucking famous people. My first boyfriend was Brian Kelly, the father on the TV show Flipper. Oh. oh masculine, hairy chest, strong yet sensitive single dad. Ugh. 
Everybody else liked the kids on that show. I liked the daddy. <laughs> to this day, I refer to any sexy, black, Irishy looking guy as Flipper's father. <laughs> he was my pillow boyfriend and the love of my life until I cheated on him with James Darren from the Time Tunnel. <laughs> I love that you played that. Because so wait, I want for people who don't know, let me just show. There's Flipper's dad. Now uh, come on. Come on. Okay. Because what what were you gonna say? Well, no, because I was so glad that there was such a nice um a response when they were both shown because James Darren was at that taping. We oh wait, my, now hold on, wait. There's no, and here's James Darren in the James day. Darren from the Time Tunnel. He was like, yeah, he was my my one of my two big crushes, and my producer. We needed to get some clearance on some film, on some photos, and my mm -hmm. producer found out that James Darren's son is a guy named Jim Moray, who's a, a mm -hmm. correspondent, entertainment reporter. She called him. He talked to his dad, and two nights before we taped the show. My producer, my director, and I went to James Darren's house, spent two hours oh with him, God. gave us photos. He gave us the rights to use. He was so wonderful. And then he came to the to the filming. And what did he say and afterwards? He over time. And he's he's just the loveliest, loveliest, but not like smarmy old Hollywood, really like, you know, on it and had great stories to tell. In fact, we're 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 due to have some kind of socially distanced coffee at any time um i he was great and and i and i loved that people clapped when they saw his oh picture. they did sitting out there you know and i don't know that they knew he was sitting out there wow i didn't know when i was there there you go i'm telling there you, you it was, at first we thought it would be weird that like hi i had a crush on you and i still kind of do he was so he after the show he came backstage, he had tears in his eyes. He loved the show so much and he gave me a hug. There was nothing turn offy about it. This, you know, straight actor guy from, from it, he loved the show, he loved the message. And I was just so thrilled that he, you know, that he took part, it was amazing. Wow, was Jim Moray there? Jim Moray was not there, I don't. Okay, Wait. him I would have recognized. I'm surprised. I, was, but I was so focused on James. I was like, yay. <laughs> wow. I had no idea he was there. And, you know, I think that anybody, and again, gay, straight, male, female, everyone had a crush. Everyone kissed their pillow. I don't know if I ever kissed my pillow, but I know they do that. You know, I saw Grease so, and love. the Pretty Bunch. Yeah. What did well. you say? Literally, I was just going to say, well, I've seen Grease and I've seen the Brady Bunch where they've done things like that. So, um, so I well, mean, there is a universality like, about that. There's a lot of younger people who may not know who James Darren is, but they right. have their own person like that, you know. So That's the point. We, we all had our little crushes, you know. Um, okay, so you get, yourself, you get yourself out of Illinois and you go to, is it New York first? Oh, well, I, a school in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon, and I went right yeah, to New York. Get out of there. All right, get, get out of school. They're not paying this show. Um, okay, so you're in New York. How long was it before you really got your big break and you were able to support yourself as an actor? You know, I, I kind of, on and off for the first five years, from 82 to 87, I did, I go away and do regional theater, and then I come mm -hmm. back and work in a restaurant. Like, I always supported myself doing one or the other, or some combination, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And in 87 is when I got my first national tour, which was um, South Pacific with Robert Goulet that I talked about on the show. Yes. And that's, that was my three, that began my three years on tour, which, you know, you make that money and you save that money and you're okay for a while, you know. Did you like and being that, on tour? Because that, did. you know, take specific types of people to enjoy being on the road. Particularly love, if you have long stops, it's great. Well, we, we had both. Um, oh, but, yeah. And I was kind of the accidental tourist a little bit. You know, I, I always joke that I'm like linen. I don't travel well. So I had to kind of learn how to do it. Um, right. But, but I was unattached, which I think made a difference because I saw marriages break up on tour, being away from Mar there. Were they oh, okay. Because I was going to say, did you have people who were dating within the company? We um, On that show, we did actually on that show. On the next show, Fiddler, we actually had a couple couples that met on the show. But if people had people back in New York, 
yeah. there were, you know, there were some. That's not were great. Like, yeah, right. it's a tough life. So being on my own was great. You know, I could go. I went to the gay bars. I went. You know, your only responsibility is the show. So you, right. you go to the gym. That's that's where I started working out because I finally had time and focus to work out and change my, you know, my exterior. Um, mm -hmm. And it was it was a good life. I enjoyed it. I it would probably be a little tougher now, mm -hmm. being older, you know, but it was a good life. You uh, talk about in the show, um, you know, being on the road and discovering working out and really sort of blossoming as the gay man you wanted to be, the gay man that you liked. And also there were, were there people in the in the company that helped you sort of discover this part of you? I forget. Well, there was, who is it the, the people who helped you with the leather? That's what I'm thinking of. Well, the leather actually, I was I was like a one man band with the, with the leather. The working out, there were a couple of guys. There was one guy in particular on South Pacific who was like a bodybuilder. And he kind of took me under his wing and kind of showed me how to do stuff and everything. But when it came to the leather, um, that happened during Fiddler when we were going for Halloween. And nobody was into leather. Nobody on tour. But inside, I was like, I thought leather was like this hyper-masculine, sexy, dirty, nasty thing that I oh, wanted sure. to be part of. So it started, the way I started was that there was a, um, a leather shop when we were in New Orleans and we were there for Halloween. Um, this place called Second Skin Leather. And I kind of went on my day off like, where are you going to? Oh, no, I'm not going anywhere. And then I went and they dressed me up like full leather, like everything. And at this left. point, people should know that you make good money on the road. So you've got disposable income. You've now and got this body. So why not? Right. And, and, and I was so about, you know, as, as we learned from the show, this exterior was very important to me and became more important than kind of my insides. And that's the journey that I also go on. But I was feeling good about myself and I had money and, you know, leather was not cheap. So no, I bought a whole not good stuff leather. And, and yeah. And then for Halloween, we all met in the lobby because people, everybody dressed up, you know, like in you know, little Bo Peep and, I don't know, some a chef. Yeah, you said beef eaters and things. Beef, right. I remember the beef eater costume that somebody rented. It was like, mm, that's fun. A lot. <laughs> and then and then I remember that the ele I came from the elevator, the elevator opened, and I stepped out. And I'm not exaggerating. Everybody in the lobby went like that. And it was a combination of, oh, he's wearing you know, his tits are hanging out. And what does that mean? And ooh, leather and ooh, leather, uh, whatever it was, I don't know, but it excited the shit out of me. And so that's when I kind sure. of went. And then I learned that leather wasn't just about dressing up. Then I started right. the lifestyle, the lifestyle and everything that came with it. You know, all the, all the initial things, S and M, you know, <laughs> FF, all of that stuff. You know, well, we've got this picture of you from that time, roughly around that time, I think. Um, there you are in a little bit of leather, not much leather, I might add. But all of that, all of the stuff on top mm -hmm. and the belt and uh, mm -hmm. except that I, I wore jeans for Halloween over them, like really ripped up jeans, like ripped up my crotch and everything. So that's just a little more extreme version of what I wore at Halloween. Yeah. There you go. Well, that that's uh, not a bad look, David Pevsner. Back then, do you have, I loved do you have I, any of that stuff still? I do, actually. In fact, I have some new stuff because a friend of mine, um, this is how it's horrible. His friend died and left him his leather, and he said, I don't wear leather. Do you want it? I was like, I'll take it. So I have a dead man's leather. That's I don't wear right. it very often for photo shoots. I'll wear it. <laughs> but, and I get possessed when I wear it. Yes, of course you do. Did you know the guy? I didn't know the guy. Oh, well, then that's all for the best. That's fine. Yeah. Um, so at this point now, you're blossoming. You're you're feeling better about yourself physically. You're being right. a little bit more extreme sexually. And so um, uh, this, <laughs> this is my one of my favorite stories. I forgot this was in the show. I've got another clip. And... Um, I had a very similar experience, but I'm going to show your experience first. This is you get back to New York. I go to the Gaiety Theater. No. 
That was a male burlesque house atop a Howard Johnson's in Midtown Manhattan. <laughs> with the strippers and the hard-ons and the Mylar curtain. Oh, it was fantastic. <laughs> well, there was a room off the stage where you could meet the dancers for later, um, transactions. But since I was such a musical comedy whore, I imagined I was like Louise in Gypsy. And I wanted to meet them and have them take me under their wing. Inside, I was still the nice Jewish boy, but I wanted so badly to act out, to be like them, to do what they did. I loved the big bisexual bodybuilder guys, the cute blonde boys with the great butts, and the hot rock and rollers, all 80s hair and tattoos. Oh, I fantasized them giving me pointers on working out and stripping down and showing off, and they'd be my hot best friends. Okay. I became best friends with many of them because uh, I lived in Boston. I lived in Boston at the time and I was doing, I was hosting male strip shows around new England. And so I would go to New York to find new people. But again, I was hosting shows, but you secretly want to be them and you want to be their best friends and you want to hang out with them and you want somebody to say, Oh, do you strip? Even though clearly nobody ever said that to me. So well, I think there's all that was a great place to hang out. And the audience was very mixed. There were a lot of people thought that they were going to be all old, disgusting guys. There were young guys, there were business Madonna. guys, there were Wall Street guys. Yep, Madonna was there, filmed her a sex book there. There was Donna who worked the the cashier, was Donna. But anyway, go ahead. Tell me. What you have well, to no, say about that it. clip was pre-workout, David. So it was me when I used to go oh. to the, when I used to go to the um, to the gaiety and be like, oh, I wish I could be like them. And then eventually, that's when I started working out after all that. But the 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 thing about the um, the gaiety theater was it was such a like you, you felt like you had to go in with a raincoat if you had. No, you know, it was out in the middle of everything. Yeah, oh, it was it was right by was the forty fifth and 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 Broadway. Um, yep. you, but then people were like, we're going to Gaiety after the show. Want to go? And I'd be like, um, oh, okay. Instead of just like, let's go. And oh, here's, here's where they come out with the hard ons and yay. The like there were some people who had no, like they just went and it was a show and it was fun. And then there were other people who were like, I'm just here to look at the hard ons. No, I hope nobody finds out I'm here. You know, that kind of thing. And it was just, it was quite an experience. Um, I, I think, I don't know. I mean, so of course it's not there anymore. No. But uh, and there's so neither the Howard Johnsons. Yeah, it's part of the old New York though that was just among you know among the gays. You had to experience it at least once. Did you ever? Did you ever dance there? I never danced there. The only stripping I ever did in New York was for Broadway Bears. Well, of course. For and I did, Jerry I, I did the shows, but the first year I did Broadway Bears, where I did kind of something small in the Broadway Bears. They had a little pre-show at Splash Bar. Remember sure. Splash? So they, they had five of us to come up with our own strips. So I, I had been in Vancouver with one of the tours, and I saw a guy strip to the song Desperado by mm -hmm. the Eagle. And he was, it was like a cowboy strip as if it's like, you know, the fire's on and it's really late at night. He's getting ready to go to bed. He strips off and then, you know, jerks off or whatever. So I, I, I plundered that. And I, I filched it, and I did that strip sure. at, at with to the music down to absolutely nothing. You couldn't show your cock, so you had to cover it up. But it was amazing to me. I think like the power that I felt as a stripper that night, right, was palpable. It was there was something about it that made me go, I love this. And yeah, it's an attention thing, and it's a like oh, streaming. absolutely. But but I had, I'd always kind of wanted that feeling, and that night kind of gave my first taste of it. It was kind of nifty. I, I but you never felt like you never felt like you should strip again, like as a vocation or for extra money. Not like that, because you know the guys that are usually strippers were much better looking than me or better body. Like that whole issue of it's not just what's here that's sexy, you know. It's here right. that's sexy. And I didn't quite. I didn't quite get that then, you know? Mm -hmm. So I thought it was like a fluke for me. Um, and then doing Broadway Bears, I was still kind of the comic guy who got naked. Right. You know? And but could live your fantasy. Right. 
Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I thought about that a lot. And, but I'm glad I had the experience to do that, to actually get up in front of people and strip, you know. And since then, I've done many other things publicly that, you know. Oh, talk. yes, you but, have. Yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, we have some friends who are saying hi. So uh, Aaron oh. Quill says hi. Hi, Aaron. We love, love you, Aaron. And uh, David Fink says hello. Oh, David, so hello, David. David. Hi. And uh, Larry Blum was helping us, telling me that the camera looked good. So thank you, Larry, for watching. Well, and of course, uh, my good friend Rocky Duran. Thank you for oh, watching, Rocky. Rocky. Um, so um, you know, I don't want to gloss over your Broadway career because you did appear in Fiddler. You did tour. You were. Uh, you know, you were on a trajectory at a certain point, and then you made a decision, which was to do When Pigs Fly, which your agent sort of uh, suggested you not do. No, it was um, well, Party. Party, I think, was the oh, party. one. Party, I'm sorry. You're right, Party. I'm right. Yeah, party right. was the one where my agent was kind of like, you know what? You do a gay show, and suddenly you become a big fat. Like, meanwhile, he was like, and he's telling me that I shouldn't do gay stuff because it's how that people will then perceive me a certain way. And I was like, well, but it's funny. It's a funny show. So I kind of right. had to. And it was him. a huge hit. It was a huge hit. And it was a surprisingly huge hit. People were like, I was really surprised. I loved that show. It was really funny. It wasn't Shakespeare by any stretch, but it no. was really funny. And then came When Pig Fly, which right. was a great show. That was a life changer for me. Right, we should mention, so Dave, our, our friend David Dillon wrote Party and Howard yeah. Crabtree, When Pigs Fly. Just because yeah. I, I always like to give credit where credit is due. So well, in the middle know. of all of that, you um, you make a decision that kind of changes your life. Where, well, was it during Party? It was during Party. Um, okay. Because I've been getting used to like kind of Broadway and tour salary. And then when you work off Broadway. Is, yeah. It, it cuts it in, a, in thirds, you know, but you're still busy and you're still, so I had this opportunity. Well, first I, I started as a naked maid. A friend of mine was a naked maid and he said, would you have any desire to do this? And I was like, okay. He's like, cause I get too much work and I need to give it off to somebody. I said, okay, I'll try that. So I did. And I kind of loved it because I love to clean, but I also love nudity. Yes, so you do. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then this, this in um, HX magazine, there was an ad for maturity escorts. And at the time I was 37. So I never thought that anybody would want, you know, I, I kind of thought about escorting, but it was like, no, it's illegal and it's bad and it's this. And I saw but the wouldn't ad. wouldn't it be sexy to have someone pay you for it? Well, yes. And, and there's a lot to talk about with that, about <laughs> getting paid to have sex. Because some people will click off and go, no, absolutely not. It's a terrible thing. And other people would be like, I'd be curious to see. Well, anyway, I explored it. I called the agency. I did an actual interview, which is in the film. Um, and it's really. And kind you, of an audition. Kind of an audition. And if you think it's an outrageous scene, it wasn't. That's what happened. So, yeah. um, no, and so I knew guys that went through similar scenes. There you go. It's. I found that it was something I needed to do. So when he actually offered me the job, when I actually got called to do a job, I was a fucking nervous wreck. But I took to it like a duck to water. Because I'm also, yes, you did. Inside, I'm a caretaker guy. I, I like, I, I talk a lot for sure, but I also listen well, you know? And sometimes it wasn't about sex. And no, and many times it's not. Many times, you know, it's about companionship. And yeah. I also learned, this is the period where because I was kind of a body Nazi, because I was only sleeping with guys with great bodies, because that's what I thought I wanted. I was now in a position where I started to have sex with people who were not necessarily attractive to me in a typical way. But I learned- well, physical to, way. In a physical way. I learned how to look beyond that. And it really changed me in terms of how I looked at men. So it wasn't just a wasted experience that was like, okay, I went and I made money and fuck you. There was a lot that went on during that period and how I changed, you know. Well, so, there's a, an interesting story. I wasn't I I wasn't gonna bring this up, but um before that, you did have an experience that kind of 
changed your life where you were with somebody who you really connected with on every level except physically. And not only did you face that yourself, but you faced it with him. Yeah. Which is a right, really, love. it's such a hard scene to watch because I think we've all been there where it hasn't been said. And to actually hear it said is just so hard to watch. It's very and difficult. And many of us have been on both sides of it. That's we've what, exactly. Leader, and we've been rejectee. And the right. fact that I that I reject him for what I do reject him for after he has proven to be absolutely perfect in other ways. Perfect, yeah. Yeah. But that, it's funny, I sent this script um, when I wanted to do it in New York to a producer out there that I knew who produced great stuff and I really liked him a lot. He read the show and he got to that scene. He went, David, I can't. I, I don't like you after that scene. I, I don't like you. And I yeah. was like, but you don't understand. That's, it's, that's the part of the show that shows how far I have to go. My journey is from A to C. Because I do that, and because I'm an asshole, and I and I own up to it in there. But Very I don't but see. I you know, let me tell you. I think the first time. Well, first off, I knew you before I saw it, so my opinion's going to be a little different. But let me just, um, say, that, let me just say that was was yeah. lost in the reading of it was me, my performance of it. I don't get out there and say, "Yeah, I did this to him." I don't, and right. so no, it's hard to explain that to him. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Well, but no, what I was going to say is that. I I I would think most people will identify with this is that you spend this time with this person you're clicking on every level he's sort of let's say average uh physically average and he's nervous because he's with somebody who he feels is out of his league which of course you've been with people who you feel out of your league so you know what he's feeling and he actually does something incredibly brave which very few people do which he says to you Something like, does my body turn you off? Does and you do off? what and you do what most polite people would do and say, oh, no. And he knows because he's put himself out there, he knows that there's a 90% chance that's what you're thinking, regardless of what you say. But as as the date has gone on, we've established this telling the truth thing to each other. Right. So I, exactly. do that, I think. I feel guilty that I wasn't truthful with him and then I'm truthful with him. And it and what's interesting about you being truthful with him is you've gotten to the point where you feel so close to him that you should tell him the truth to see where this goes. And yeah. by telling him the truth, it stops it. So, I mean, again, it's so layered and so interesting. And I think anybody watching this has been in a situation where either they're with somebody who they wonder, Am I good enough for them? Or they've been with somebody and they're like, oh, Jesus, I'm not really this guy, but let's plow through. Yeah. There's just so much, uh, there's so much to identify with. And I want people to know that. Yeah. But, but rarely does anyone ask, rarely does anybody tell the truth. Totally. And so when you establish that situation, when that becomes a cornerstone of the very first moment you meet each other, it goes into truth, 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 truth. When you veer from that, it feels mm -hmm. weird. And so I couldn't yeah. let it feel weird. And look what happened. But you'll have to see the film, see what happened. I know, right. I don't want to get, go into it too much. Did you, uh, is, have you connected with him since? I don't yes. remember if you talk about it in the show. Do you it's talk about no, it in the show? very recent. This is very oh, okay. recent. Can you, tell, can you tell us anything about that? Or do you want to tell me after? I, I don't want to go into it too much. Okay. Tell but, me off screen. It's fine. But, okay. Yeah. It, I'm, st I'm still kind of, it was. It wasn't. It. It wasn't good. It wasn't about the show not being good. I think yeah. that um, we watched it and didn't like how he was portrayed. And mm. well, and and it's too bad because he's actually the guy you walk out going, he's perfect. Right. Grab yeah. Him. Although, you know. again, you know what I've also learned is that that is not how he's going to remember it or see it. And Absolutely. you know, you know, as bad as you feel about yourself, he feels you were a different kind of bad, perhaps. Um, well, this is what and, you get, and you know, when you write about the truth and you write about, you know, real things that happen, what I've learned is you have to understand that not everybody's going to love that and that right. you have to, you have to, have, you have to tell the story the best way you possibly can and the most honest way you can, right. but 
having done that, there are going to be people who are like, no, 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 no. I don't want to talk to you anymore. And so well, that's. I, um, and especially, I think it's harder if there are people in your life you cared about who you're not in contact anymore. So you can't even run it by them. And you have to just go with your story. Um, well, I'm working weird. on that. And, I, I'm working on that because I've been writing a personal piece. I don't really want to go into what it is, but um, I, I feel a huge responsibility to people who I have strong feelings for, and yet I'm not in touch with. So it's awkward to call them and say, I'd like to include this, but so you have to really go by, you're telling your story. And maybe you're telling their story through your eyes, but that's the best you can do. And then it comes down to how much are you going to couch it? Like how much, how much are you going to change in your life, your description of them or something to, to put people off the scent so that even they wouldn't recognize themselves because yeah, it's the story, I think that's, it's awesome. the story that's important. It's the, it's the resonance of the story that's important. It's not necessarily important to say he was this, this, and this specifically, you know, yeah, I'm there was. Um, I'm thinking of a story. Uh, Donna McKechnie does a story. I don't want to out her story, but I know something about the story. And I went up to her afterwards. We were at a party, hanging out together. And we're talking about the show, and I asked him, "Wow, what a great story this was! Did that really happen?" And she went, "No, that's not actually how it happened." I said, and she told me the real story. And I'm like, oh, which it doesn't have the impact. And I said, well, why didn't you tell that story? And she's like, the truth isn't always the best story. And it's so I, hard to hear that. And Liza told me something similar when I said, did that happen? And she's like, no, but this is the story. And, you know, what yeah, do you do? I, I'm on the fence about that because mm -hmm. I've also worked with some people who are writing shows and. We'll go up, we'll go along and I'll kind of help. I'm kind of targeting a little bit. And after a certain section, they'll say to me, well, here's what really happened. And it's something that's I a little that. more difficult or, or doesn't reflect on them very well. And, but it's so much more human. It's so much exactly. more relatable. And, and then I go, look, that's the story you want to tell. The other thing is, the other thing is this, this one is. Well, right. You know, it's like, it's like going to a therapist and I, been to therapy. I know you've been to therapy and I've had therapists say, okay, stop performing for me. You know, don't, don't tell, don't tell me the story like Billy Masters in quotes tells it. Let's talk about it. Or, and the other thing I was going to mention is I remember in therapy being told you're trying to protect the other person in how yeah. you're telling the story. Cause you're like, well, he did this, but, and you explained away, he's like, but does it matter what happened no, and how do you feel about it? But having said all that, I went through periods like when I first started developing um, this as a film script. One of the things I told the story exactly as it happened. And one mm -hmm. of the guys who was helping me out was like, you know, David, this part of it, I know it looks like it's important to you, but it's really not. And well, you, tell you, and you need of, those people. You, you kind of, yeah, because just because it happened, like I will agree with Donna and Liza, just because it happened that way doesn't mean it's going to be interesting or resonant. You do have to kind of right. sift through it and tell this. But the minute you start to make up a lot of shit that, yeah. that kind of pushes the story in a direction you want it to go, then it becomes more of a narrative, you know, then it becomes yeah. more of, of a, a, a fictional thing. But I do believe that you have to glean as much of the truth as you can and then kind of help it along so that it becomes a ghost, so it becomes a theater, it becomes a film, you know. And I mean, also power it down. There's a there's a great video. Um, there are two videos. Um, when Elaine Stritch was doing her one woman show at Liberty, you could see the show. But there's another sh uh, video, which is a documentary, putting it together and where they say this is an important story, but it doesn't serve the show. And mm -hmm. we have to take it out or we have to somehow shift it to fit the narrative. And it's, it's really, it's a hard thing to do. And well, I, I applaud you have, for doing it successfully. It's good to have the third eye because I've worked with yeah. Randy Brenner. Randy Brenner has been my director He's on great. all the shows I've written. And I love Randy because he really, he has a good ear and eye for what works and what doesn't. And he'll also, and, and he's not like, you know, I think like 75%, I have a percentage of like things that I absolutely agree with, 
I kind of agree with, and then absolutely not, I'm right on this, you know, and we work really well together that way. But what I like about him is that he will say, you know, David, I get why you want that in there. As an outside person watching it, it, it doesn't matter to me one bit. It, it right. doesn't help it along. You, you think it's some because it says something about me or it says something about the, it's like, we don't need it. We don't need it. Bum, 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 bum. And it's good. And to you that. do need that. Yeah. I think that yeah. a lot of the, though, I think that's the difference between the universal shows and the um, vanity shows that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. When people it does elevate if, it. If it's a cabaret act, like I've seen great cabaret acts, you know, I oh. really have. But it's the cabaret acts where I feel like I walk out of there knowing the person better than when I walked in, rather than just I sing really well and I tell a story. I, I like that, but I love it when you Karen Mason used to be that way when I first saw her in Chicago God, I love years Karen. ago. She used to tell really great stories and then she'd sing and you'd be like, Oh my like at the end of the show, I would just be like laughing and crying and and just wanting to be like her because she's such a good storyteller, you know. And then there was uh, what thing. Yeah, no, I know. I think there's two kinds of shows, but there was uh there was people who read my column um will know I went to a show, let's say in the past year, year and a half, um, of somebody I like very much who was doing a one person show. And um it was in a truncated uh, a format that I assumed it was a truncated form, and I came out of it saying it was all pleasant, but I didn't really learn anything about him. And he asked me, uh, no, no, excuse me, strike that. It was his manager who asked me what I thought, because I don't think I would have said this to his face. And I said, well, it's a great show. And this person comes off really well and sounds really good. But it's just too bad that it doesn't have any meat to it. And we've probably lost all the personality from it because it had to be cut down in this format. And the manager kind of looked a little ashen. And I said, what's wrong? He's like, this is the show. It wasn't cut at all. And I'm like, oh, well, you may want to work on that. Yeah. Because what do you do? Um, and but it's also they may not have that in them to bring. Well, look, there are some people, look, uh, again, especially telling this story, when I wrote it as a film, I was like, I'm glad I wrote it as a film because it's up on the screen. I can pretend it's a story. I don't have to tell people I was a hooker. And so I can divorce myself from it. But when I finally decided I'd have the guts to tell the story on the stage, I knew yeah. that, again, it, it di didn't want it to just be, hey, look what I did. I had to find some way to make sure that when I tell the story, that the audience puts themselves in my shoes so they experience it with me, not just looking at me, you know? And it, it's a, it took a long time to get there in the readings and oh, little sure. audiences and stuff. But, you know, I, I, I really think with this one that I really, you know, I've kind of tapped into that. Anybody watching it with an open mind will enjoy it because it's the way I like to tell a story. I don't want to, if there's a fisting joke that needs to be told within the context of it, I'm telling the mm -hmm. fucking fisting joke. And it'll be funny because of context and because of character and all that, I hope. And obviously people know fisting is a laugh riot. You don't want to laugh too hard at the time. <laughs> Um, Tom Frank asks a question. Do you think you chose to write this show so that you can be emotionally naked to people to compensate with not being physically naked now? Tom, first, let me just tell you, he is pretty physically naked in the show. Aren't not you? Really. I just take my shirt off when I do the stripper. After that, that Don't clip you change that you pants. Know? You take your pants off. No, not in the show. What show were you watching? Didn't you take your pants off and put on a, sh uh, a short? Maybe at the celebration, did you ever change oh, your pants? Oh, celebration, I did, I did nudity more than once. Okay, because um, I'm maybe because I've seen it so many times. I'm sorry, but uh, no, all right, please. sorry, Tom. There is no nakedness there. So, so getting back to his question, did you want to be emotionally naked to compensate for not being physically naked? Although you were emotionally naked in the original version. Well, look, we talked about when when we were developing the show. Um, we talked about me go, doing nudity in this show, and okay. then Randy and I kind of thought, you know what? It doesn't. First off, it doesn't need it. I mean, it might be more sensationalistic, but for all the people that would come see it, it would also turn some people off. And and look, I'm all about nudity, and I'm all about sex, public, and all that. I'm all about that. But here's an, an yeah. instance where for this particular show, I don't think that nudity 
helped the story at all. I think it would have veered it off to a weird direction. So for this, it, so when people ask, is there nudity? I'm always like, well, there's emotional nudity, but there's no real nudity. Well, so all it, right, you get to see so him with the shirt off. The good thing is people can't see you naked online because you do have a website. I do. I uh, do. I and uh, he has an onlyfans.com slash real guy LA. Tell people why you started this site. Um, well, for years, and people didn't really know this about me, but back since 1989, I posed nude for Tom Bianchi. And I talk about that in the show. Oh, and, and so, yes, uh, and here's the first photo shoot. I blurred it just in case the YouTube Nazis bother us. Is that the first Trump photo day. shoot? Yeah, that's the very first Tom Bianchi shot that I did where I was afraid. And to that's on me. Fire Island? That was on fi his house at Fire Island, yeah, on his rooftop. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you go with your continuous story. So I And so from that, and I kind of loved this feeling because that's when I had started working out my body, and I loved this this freedom that I was feeling. So I worked with a couple of photographers in New York, but when I came to Los Angeles, I got into this whole community of photographers and, and artists who were doing sexuality and nudity. And I posed for a lot of stuff, but mostly the photos were between the photographer and me. And every so often there'd be like an art book where one would show up or, or an exhibit or something. But I felt like I was kind of holding them back. Like there was a shame in me about these naked pictures. So when Tumblr, in 2013, I think it was, I heard about Tumblr, the mm -hmm. blog, a good post. I started my own Tumblr blog called Shameless. And I started to post all the photos that I've been shooting over the years. And oh, I got wow. a lot of followers on it. And, and I was kind of loving it because I felt like, oh, there's a place for this. And, and I tried to do really creative photo shoots where you know we would put a, a put it in a context and, and I would name it something funny to be ironic with what's going on. And I tried to really take it from an artist's standpoint. Although to mm -hmm. some people there he is with his hot hard cock how he's a porn person. You know, it was right. it started to go like when is it porn? When is it art? It started to address all of this. And that was fine until and I kept doing shoots until 2018 when um, Tumblr decided that they were going to purge adult material because they oh. wanted a more positive Tumblr, which meant that nudity and sexuality is negative to them. And I will not have that. So I started to find other venues to try and do another gallery. I had five years of building this gallery, curating it. So I started a new Tumble page, which I still have, which you could go on for free. You just have to join. You can go on, you see the photos there. But then, I had also started to shoot some erotic videos with this filmmaker friend of mine. And they were kind of nifty and arty and fun. And I thought, I'm never going to post them, but we'll see what happens. I had started this OnlyFans page for, with the photos because everybody was doing it at the time. And it was free. Mm -hmm. Then the pandemic hit. And I thought, you know what? Yeah. Now's the time. I'm so fucking sick of holding back on these. And so I started to post the videos. And I had like thousands of people for the photos when it was free. Then when uh -huh. I started to charge because the videos had started to go down, but still, still pretty good. And so to this day, I continue to try to do fun and sometimes artistic, sometimes raunchy, sometimes triple X. I do all kinds of stuff. And it's been such a great expression of this little boy inside who always wanted to express his sexuality, but do mm -hmm. it as an artist. And it's been great. So that's kind of the journey that I've been on and with it. And look, and I hear all the stars are getting OnlyFans page now. Only fans oh, page. yeah. Great. Tyler Posey just started one and someone oh, else yeah. started one last week. Yeah, I know. Um, do, does, does it make you think to yourself that, again, the what ifs, that what if you had done this stuff earlier and had it well again some of it you did do early and you have to use now so, but was there yeah but is there something that oh i wish i had filmed myself earlier you know i've, I've on the forum sometimes people say you're too damn old to be doing that you should have done it when you were younger and hotter and i'm like okay that's part of why i do that this, this mission <laughs> this anti-body shame anti-ageism right. pro-sexuality thing it's like i wasn't ready to do it back then okay right. And now I'm choosing to do it because what I found with Tumblr was 
you know, there are guys out there who like older guys, who like right. to look at older guys. And so it's not for everybody, but there's definitely an audience for it. There's an audience, and because that's what I want people to understand is that if you're 70 years old and you know, you, you're never done, there will always be somebody interested in you, you know? That's what I learned with this. And so don't feel like you hit 50, I gotta hang it up, I'm done. Nobody's gonna want me anymore, I don't work out of this. That's not true, it is so not true. There's something for everybody out there. And I want people to feel better about themselves no matter where they're at. Yeah, I think that that's important. I think it changes, and I Absolutely. think you have to be willing to change along with it. I think that when it becomes sad, of uh, the people who don't change with it, the people who try to look like they did when they were 30 and they're in their 50s or 60s, I remember one notable um, porn, gay porn executive. Oh, God, I don't want to say who what. It doesn't really matter. He had given advice to Jeff Stryker when Jeff Stryker had really started becoming reclusive, like in his late thirties. And he said to Jeff Stryker, what you should do right now is do a million different photo shoots and a million different videos and put them away and then dole them out. Like every five years, Oh, he's still working and look how good he looks. And I think Jeff kind of took part of that advice and is still doing it now, but in a almost creepy way, even though I love it's you, Jeff, like if you're watching. You kind of do have to know who you are in the moment. And yeah, there's, there is such a thing as trying to recapture the past, which is very hard to do. And I don't Obviously, recommend it. Yeah. It reminds me of um, when in 1987, I think it was when Lucille Ball did her last sitcom life with Lucy. Life with Lucy. Yep. Life with Lucy. And at that point, the Golden Girls had already been on. And I thought, oh, they're going to take this show. They're going to put Seal Ball into more of a, a, a more a different context now that she's, you know, really an older woman. She's not going to do all that crazy stuff. They'll put her in something more substantial, more emotional, more that they'll give her a chance to really do it. And sure enough, in the in, I watch. I remember watching the first episode, and she got Gail Gordon's tie stuck in a pasta maker, and I was like, "I'm done. Yeah, I don't want to see yep. this and now." That's what it was. And she was trying, you know, was trying to like re redo what she'd done in the '50s and '60s. And they could have progressed her and said, "Let's still be still funny, but let's find a different way to 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 do it so that it's not embarrassing." Well, and I'm I think sure that there are. There are two things at play, though. I mean, it's your image of yourself and what the audience wants to see. And she had, before that, had done Stone Pillow, tried to be dramatic and a bag woman and look terrible. And she heard from fans, they wanted to see the old Lucy. And, yeah, you know, they, what do they, you do? At that point, it doesn't work, you know, because it, we've gone so far as it comes since then. So it didn't work. So I think, you know, as I go about doing, you know, filming stuff and doing photo shoots and stuff, yeah, I mean, I try to keep in mind that I'm a man of 60 plus, but I, it's, it's like- you are? I keep forget. I, 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 I always say that you're just a couple of years older than me. How old are you? I'm 61. Oh, I, I'm 61. I, oh my God. Okay, well, you're a lot older than me, but still. <laughs> Not that much older than me. Look, you may be older, but you look better. So as far as I Well, no, you look great. And by the way, yeah. the lighting's yeah. really good there. Too. Oh, so, well, thank you. Well, you know, all right. I'll keep, see, there's the lighting that make you, can I just say, I'll tell I you I was unhappy coming. about the lighting before. I, but I, yes, I was very unhappy. Um, that, uh, oh, wait, did you freeze? Oh, no. Okay, you're back. So a couple yeah. weeks ago, I was asked to do a reading, you know, as we're all doing these free readings. And so I said, fine. And I got the breakdown and it said, Queenie flamboyant 30s. And I said, well, clearly they got me because they need someone in this who looked 30s. So everybody was in these little boxes with this like prison grade lighting and they all looked terrible. And suddenly I show up, hello boys. <laughs> they went, all right. You got your ring light working. I do. Oh no. I mean, it's, I mean look, we're, but, but speaking of, of uh, looking good. So here you are in the day ish and here you are. More recently. Now, first off, the first thing I think to myself is, well, wait, at one point he was in my apartment. So <laughs> that wasn't shot in your apartment. I don't think I ever no. shot anything in your apartment. 
No, I don't think you did. Uh, and if you did, long as I don't know, it's fine. I don't care. Um, because my apartment looked better when I came back than it did when I gave it to you. Well, that's because I'm a personal organizer. Yes, you right. are. <laughs> hey, you, David, would, David would email me while I was on the road, and he'd say, can I please organize your apartment because it's killing me? You get so much media. You were getting so much media from people, like CDs yeah. and TV. Oh, was it God. even CDs back then? I yeah, don't. It, it might have been, yeah. It was VHS but... piles and piles and piles. And oh. so, like, I'd go to put down a glass, and I'd be like, "There's nowhere to put." Right. Can there I were no it? surfaces. There still are no surfaces. <laughs> I need to do you that back in my that. apartment. Yeah, I know. I need you back. Um, so again, I think people should you know, I use those other photos also to just show that you can look good at it. As you just said, you can look good at any age and you, you, you know also what? don't nice. stay caught up in trying to look good. No, look, I, I know how my body has changed. But what I always tell people, because people are like, you know, I would never do that. I would never pose. And I was like, you know what? I think you should pose nude. Don't you don't have to you don't have to keep the photos. You don't have to share the photos. There's something so freeing about being naked in front of the camera. It is a great freeing experience. I would tell anybody to do it. Some people like I'm not saying put your dick on the internet. You have to think about that, you know, in terms of what you feel it might like. I don't give a shit anymore. I still right. work as a mainstream actor. Some people won't hire me, but some people it makes me more interesting, you know. But, oh, and that's good. You just gave me the perfect segue because we do have some clips of David in action. Or at least we have one here. We do have one. Okay, we have one. So I remember seeing this show and I remember say, I, I remember texting you saying, oh my God, there you are. You're on my screen live. And this was just so you know what's coming up. It was a Sunday night. So it was column night. And so here's a clip of David in action. Her credit card has been declined. I just went shopping with it. <laughs> try it again. Ma'am, I ran it three times and then I called the bank. Now may I try another card? Will you just give me a moment? It's my pleasure. Oh, hi. Um, do you see that man over there? Dark hair, handsome. I need you to slip this to him without anybody noticing. I said the handsome guy. That guy wasn't handsome. You have your taste. I have mine. All right, there <laughs> two different episodes, but I uh I like later. I remember seeing you on on Desperate Housewives and going, oh my, I mean, I was so excited to see somebody who I knew. I mean, I knew people who were on the show, but like somebody I didn't expect all of a sudden shows up. Well, you know, I, I have done TV since then. And you do, yes, you, you get have. like messages saying like, oh, I saw you on Silicon Valley or, and it's kind of neat because you'd like do those things and then you kind of move on. And sometimes right. like I have HBO, so I didn't know that was on. And so- it's kind of it's kind of you know fun to be a part of like TV history and whatever, you know what whatever capacity. Um, I've had great roles. I've had very small roles, and I'm grateful for all of it because I do so many other things that it, that's a part of my life. You know, um, has so your networking and visibility in the gay community helped you get roles, or hurt you, or not change anything at all? For the, I've done a lot of gay independent films. Yeah, and so I kind of grew a little bit of a reputation off of those, leading to more gay independent films, and that's fine because I love doing them. I've gotten some great opportunities doing them. In terms of the larger stuff, yeah, yeah I, I can't say that I've like really hit when it comes to network TV. I've done a bunch of stuff, but um, you know, I, I I take what comes to me, you know, and I audition for whatever, and then I do my organizing and I do my OnlyFans and I have a book coming. I mean, I keep busy. With so yeah. many things that I try to keep it balanced. And if one thing's not being out the way I want to, sometimes I'll really throw myself into it. And sometimes I'll be like, ooh, left turn, focus on that. Well, again, you know, you've mentioned there were other things. I saw you on Modern Family as a, a, a doctor. Uh, what's her name's doctor, right? Um, I play a lot of oh, doctor face. Yeah. I play a lot. Of oh, yeah, there were a lot of doctor clips. Now that I think of it, I saw a bunch. Yeah. Um, but then Old Dog's New Tricks and, you know, different things like that, that are the uh, more gay targeted. But you've yeah. worked steadily. You know, I, I guess you could say that, but I haven't had 
Um, and because I, you know, I've also done, I went, there are times I go away, like go away from TV so that I could focus on my one man show and really developing that. Um, I feel like, yeah, if I had focused just on doing television, would I be, uh -huh. you know, uh, a character on, because you see how people build their careers. You see them. Absolutely. Patricia Heaton was like a, 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 a speaking role on 30 something back in 1989. You know, and she was really good. And you saw over the years, she built and built and built and built. Now she's a right. crazy Republican. But besides that, um, right. I've, I've kind but of like, like a Tim Bagley and people like that who worked steadily and then were recurring. Exactly. Exactly. I, I've just not gone in that direction, you know, it, and it's right. not that I don't feel like I'm bad or anything. It's just that, you know, sometimes you have to come into your age a little bit. Like those guys know, like him and um, Sam, um, oh my God. Uh, Jack Plotnick and uh, oh my God, Sam, Pan Sam Pancake. Those guys, Drew Sam Drogi, Pancake, yep. they're so goddamn mm -hmm. funny. They're such great comedians, and there's a place yes. for them for what they're doing. That's great, and I love like you know Jim J. Bullock is a very good friend of mine, mm -hmm. and and I love Jim, and he's he's a fantastic actor. But what people don't know about him is what a fantastic, serious actor he is. And I am hoping one day that he gets his opportunity. To kind of turn it all on its ear and make people cry. He's so you know, it's funny. I, I there's a clip I have somewhere, but I had uh worked with Joan Rivers on her daytime talk show, and she had brought um the cast of Hollywood Squares when she was on that incarnation that John Davidson hosted, mm -hmm. and Jim J. Bullock was like the the regular, you know, acerbic one at that point. And John Davidson on the show said, what people don't realize, Jim J. Bullock can do anything. All they have to do is give him a chance. He is so talented. And Jim didn't trust that moment. And he went in, he played it up, said, sure, I could play a cop. Freeze. And I said, <laughs> oh, you had this moment, but he quit. He can't help himself from going for the laugh. Yeah. And um, it's tough though when you're in the can. when you're when you're in the the public eye in a certain way. Like Howard Stern once, you know, said something about him being like the wacky gay neighbor, and so that's when Howard Stern says it. It kind of puts like a stamp on you a little bit. And right. I've just I've seen him do things like because I took acting class with him and and um, singing class, and then I, I saw I did, him in End of the World Party. I saw him. And he's been was great. great. Yes, and, great. And you know, it's it's when I was in college. Um, one of the things they tried to be out of you was if you were at all effeminate, if you were at all like kind of veering towards being gay, they would try to beat that out of you because they're like, you won't be able to play. And I did your management though. Your management did it too. My management was like, you know, you got to stop being gay stuff because you become a big fag. When, and what it comes down to is I look at somebody like David Drake, for instance. When I yeah. saw his one man show, uh, The Night Larry Kramer Kissed Me, I was wrapped. Because in college, I was told that that actor would never succeed. He would never succeed being just kind of who he was because he was a little, a little effeminate and you like, you can't, he can't play every role. Well, first of all, who can play every role except maybe Meryl Streep. But no. you find, you find out who you are and then you use that for whatever role you can. And sometimes right. it's obvious, like they want the cop to be this. No, they want the cop to be more like David Drake. So you've got to have the confidence the wherewithal to be who you are. And when I saw David doing that, that's what kind of inspired me to go, you know what? I don't have to cover up anymore. I don't have to like, right. you know, show up at, on a set like this. I can kind of be who I am, play the role, play the character, and but imbue why it's me playing the role and not that guy, you know? Right. It really taught me a lot. And, and I think there's a little more room now with shows like Pose and, you know, um, just a ton of stuff where there's the opportunity that you don't have to be in there and kind of be that like generic straight acting guy, you know, what is straight acting? There's not, there's well, no. And you may not get called for those jobs anyway. I mean, there's nothing more infuriating than see somebody who is a great comedian, not want to go for the roles that they would be perfect for because they want to play against type and they may not get those roles, but they may have missed some great opportunities that would have had nuance. That's why It's really about, like I just said, go in and look, am I, you know, the star of a, of a, sitcom or an hour-long drama now no i am not no 
<laughs> but what I like, to, but what I try to do is when I go in, you know, I could play it the, the generic way, or I could go in and give it me. And it's why it's I may not be what they want for it, but you make an impression so that they go, you know what? He's not getting the role, but I'm a fan, and I like what he does, and I like who he is. And that's when the hope comes, you know. And and look, the bigger stuff may not ever happen for me. I hope it does, um, I because I not. love. But, you know, like I said, I balance my life with all these other things. So I'm okay. You know, it's, right. I don't feel like a failure. I feel like, you know, I've done so many different things in my life. I've been unafraid to explore some of the, the dicier ones that people would be like, like in the show. Um, I found a picture. You know, I was doing research on you as if I have to do research on you. But uh, I found a picture and I'm curious. And I, I'm, oh, firstly, I just want to show a picture of you in When Pigs Fly, because I just yeah, thought you great. were so great in that show. It's such a great show. Jim Jay was in that show as well, now that I think of it. In L.A., yeah. We did yes, it together. Did That's the LA. Yes, I remember. Um, but, I and I the, maybe around the time of this photo, I just want to know, is there a story behind this picture? There's no story, except that Ann Miller came to see the show here in L.A. at the Coronet Theater. And afterwards, I got a photo with her, and she was, <laughs> she was. I mean, you know, like you were saying to me before, we we're saying here or to me before about how like you wish you had gotten a photo with. Sometimes you go like, oh, why didn't you get a photo? Yeah, I, I never like, I never got photos with people because even now I forget that I have a camera on my phone. That take right. But back then I was like, oh no, I got to find somebody to take picture of me with Ann Miller. This is important. This is dire. Yeah. Well, it's out there online. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I just well, want to remind you. I did yes. a play by Kenny Solmes, her good friend, Kenny Solmes. Uh, sure. And, and the opening night, it was it was a very crazy, crazy thing. But the opening night in this little tiny theater had Joan came to see it. Um, Michelle, Michelle um, Pfeiffer and her husband and Brenda Vaccaro and Lily Tomlin. And it was like half the audience was celebrities. And did I have my camera? Did anybody take yeah. pictures? No. No. <laughs> that would have been fun. Every once in a while, somebody will post a photo of like an event from like 20 years ago. And they'll say something like, oh, here I am with this famous person. And I will see in the background... I think that's me because I know that I was at these parties, but I didn't take photos either. But it you and one of the time, and one of the one of the pictures, Facebook actually tagged me, and I said I wasn't at that. Oh, yeah, that is me. So it happened recently um, with a Diana Ross concert, and somebody took a picture with Diana Ross, and I remembered being in the front row with J. Randy Tarabarelli, and sure enough. There we are. And I'm like, oh, oh my God. God. So, so, um, and there are things that you say, oh, I never got a photo of that night, but now there is something. Um, well, I want to remind you, people. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, just getting older, you realize, like, because it, was, it wasn't important to me at the time. You know, like, ugh, at the moment, the moment is more important. I don't want, I didn't feel like I needed somebody to take the picture of me to spoil the moment of it. And now I'm kind of like, I wish I had a little memento of that. That would have been nice. Well, Beyond, my you know. mother, my mother was like that. I would go. I, I remember, and and specifically, just telling another story of myself. Um, but Please. we had gone to see um the great opera singer Marilyn Horn give a concert in Boston, and ironically enough, this story about us with Marilyn Horn is how she opens her autobiography. But there was no photo from it. But because there was a blind woman in front of us and wanted an autograph and she introduced Marilyn Horn to her dog and the dog say, name say was Muffy. And so Marilyn made out the autograph to Muffy, but then they, the blind woman had say, no, I'm Carol, not Muffy. So she had to rewrite the, anyway, my mother right. and I are right there during this story. And then it shows up in Marilyn's book. But anyway, I got an autograph from Marilyn Horn. My mother 
did not get an autograph, wanted to have the moment with her and look her in the eye and talk to her. And yeah. afterwards I said, why didn't you get an autograph? She said, because I had a choice of getting an autograph or having a moment. Yeah, And that was a really big lesson to me because you cannot have both. That's true because they'll just, unless at the very end you kind of sneak in, oh, can I get your autograph? Just sneak that in. No, as a matter of fact, on my friend Freddie, I hope Freddie is watching this. You know Freddie. Um, hey, when the Witches of Eastwick was filming in Boston, and he's the biggest Cher fan in the world, he mm -hmm. brought me with him to the set, and he wanted to get uh, a photo with Cher, and he also brought things to autograph. So she's autographing things, but all the photos are her looking down autographing, not looking in the camera, because you cannot have it all. Yeah, um, but you can have it all if you watch musical comedy horror. Yeah. Although apparently that is as much nudity as you're going to get. That truly is. Good and actually, <laughs> that that yes. photo, like in the show, you, yes, that that photo is, is it's there's there's no futz with it. That's how I looked when I took the photo after the show, like months after the oh, show. Oh, really? Yeah, during the show, I'm a little beefier, but I'm kind of okay with that because. I'm, that's more representative of what I was like back then. That photo is what I was like back in the day, even though it was taken recently. But in the show, oh, okay. it's kind of like, you know, this kind of, you know, portly guy telling the story. But well, it's kind I don't of, think you know, I use real. that. I don't it's think that, you, know, you look great. And um, great. Uh, let's remind people where they can see it. Hold on. I got it down here. Okay. So just go to musicalcomedyhorror.com and it will but tell you where you, you can see it. Make on sure you click where how to, to watch. How to watch. Yeah, because it just makes it easy. This whole musical comedy stud, musical comedy horror thing that like confuses the fuck out of people. Me too. This has the list. You click on it. You know, you can do it on your cable. You can get in touch with Amazon. You can do whatever. But this is everything in one place. And again, people can buy the DVD or they can stream it live. If you don't want to wait, you're sitting home during a pandemic, touching yourself inappropriately and saying, I'd like to look at something and hear a few songs. Great songs, by the way. I think people don't realize you have written some really funny songs. We had you on for the Naked Boy Singing Show. The two most popular songs in Naked Boy Singing are Naked Ma Maid and Perky Little Porn Star, both Aww. written by David Pevster. Well, that was another aspect of the kind of acting out. I always felt like I loved kind of dirty humor, but dirty humor that was really funny or really clever. And so that's how oh, I started very writing clever. songs. And so I tried to I tried to continue to do that. And so those are the songs in this show. Um, I don't know. I, I I just want people to laugh. I hope they get moved by it. Um, I, I'm really proud of it. And. I know that it plays. And he does more. take you on a journey. You know, I really think people have to know that uh, the show takes you on a journey. If it isn't graphic, certainly not graphic enough for my taste, but I've seen unless a graphic. The and unless the fisting joke or, you know, bothers you. Some of the length yeah, is just well, bit, but, but it's not, I, I don't get naked. I mean, there's some descriptive stuff that's pretty, you know, but, but by the time you get to it, you're so kind of, I believe you're so kind of with me that you may be like this, but you'll be laughing at the same time. So that's all I care about. And if you want to see more nudity and give them a few bucks, onlyfans.com slash real guy LA. And, yep. um, you know, you get look, so between these two clip places, you'll get your fill of David Pevsner. And by the way, can I just point out to people that you are, no, not bitter and back. You are most versatile. That's my CD. I love that cover. I, do too. I love that cover. My my, I have a graphic artist friend who came up with that, and I just thought it was so goddamn clever. So, your homage yeah. to Bruce Springsteen, because I talk about in the show about how I was voted in school because I did all the activities and stuff that they voted me most versatile. Little did they know. Well, and uh, and you are. I think you know. I don't. I don't normally ask people. You know their preferences, but you are very versatile. I am proudly. You know, when people used to ask me questions like that or anything about, I'd get all kind of like flushy and blushy and be like, I don't know if I want to say, I don't care anymore. Yeah. I like to get fucked and I like to fuck. What about it? You know? There you go. And you are single. 
I am. And it's, <laughs> well, you know how it, how it is when like you're, I, I'm usually pretty good alone. Like I'm a bit of a loner anyway, but yeah. because of the pandemic, this is ridiculous already to not have the, oh, yeah, this is a lot of alone to connect. It's a lot of alone. And <laughs> it's making me really want to, you know, connect and not, not sexually, you know, not even that I really would love to, you know, it's time. It's, it's time to really, you know, set up shop with somebody and, and build something worthwhile. I I'd, I'd really you know, there was, there was one night I, I don't see it's all blending together. It's been seven months, but there was one night that we saw each other on Facebook and we said, I sent the link to you and we just chatted because I, this is like the only way we really have Look, connection, Making you know, connection face to face is so, is so much better, but look what we have. We have this, we have, you know, zoom, we have, you know, Skype streaming and it's, services. It's yeah, it's good. <laughs> But it's just not the same, you know, even no. I think I had dinner with a friend twice in his backyard, socially distant. And, I, you know, I, I, I can't when I see people like, you know, parties with friends and stuff like that, even though they're wearing masks or whatever, I'm still like I'm still a little uncomfortable with that. And that's right. So it makes the lonely even kind of not the well alone, lonely. They are lonely. Two different things. Yeah. There are two different things. And I'm feeling a bit of both of them. Yeah, um, I'm but, sure. But the good thing is that if people are feeling a little lonely, you can have David Pevsner in your house. Musical comedy or laughing your ass off. He's selling it off stage on stage and off. Who came <laughs> up with that? I did. Of course you did. So get all the information at musicalcomedyhorde.com. Watch uh, where to watch, how to watch. What is it again? How, how to uh, how to watch. How, how to, to watch it. Oh, I don't remember. But whatever I don't know. you'll figure yeah. it out. Look, if you can't figure it out, email me. I'll tell you, David, it's always a delight talking to you. Stay on and we'll talk afterwards. Guys, thank you for watching Absolutely. Billy Masters Live. Thank you for uh, um, uh, hanging in there with us. This was not the easiest show to get going, but once you, you, you know, on the replay, technology. you beat uh, it. You know, on the replay, we will cut those first 15 minutes and it will look kind of funny. And you'll be sitting there saying, what happened? And now we'll tell you. It was a little bit of a shit show, but we got through it. If Ed Asner, if this happens with Ed Asner, he's going to be flummoxed. He will Can not I just be say happy. one more thing about Ed Asner? Yeah, when you of course. yeah please, yeah. please. Um, you know, one of my favorite television moments of all time is in the pilot of Mary Tyler Moore when he goes, you know, she says, you got spunk. And then she goes, well, yeah. And he goes, I hate spunk. It's a very funny thing. But now being an older gay man, sexualized, yeah. when I <laughs> when I see that clip, my mind goes in a whole different place with spunk. Well, can I tell you, because of that, uh, when I wrote the column, uh, which is out right now, which, of course, everybody can read on. Where the fuck is my column? I don't even know where. Oh, Billymasters.com. You know, I don't promote my own show enough, but um, you should. You need uh, to. I know, I know, because we need we need subscribers. We've lost a lot of people because people are hurting during the pandemic. And um, but just so you people know, um, most of the papers that I'm in, most gay papers have shut down. There are only a few papers left. Everything is online. Nobody is paying writers. Nobody pays for this show. So there is no money coming in. So if you can take a subscription to billymasters.com for $5 a month, you keep our, keep it all of keep, you'll keep the empire afloat. But in this week's column, I announced Ed Asner on the, sh uh, coming on the show. And then I said, speaking of spunk, we'll also have David Bevsner. That's right. That's right. I think that's what made me think about it when I read that. <laughs> and I said, not most people aren't going to get that, but you know, <laughs> that's why we get the big bucks. Those $5 a month don't come cheap. That's it. Um, oh, wait, there's a, there's a comment. Wait. Oh, oh, and, and it's worth it. Well, thank you, Tom Frank. Um, uh, guys, thank you for watching, David. Thank you for playing with us. Um, so and fun. to everyone, go uh, go check him out and watch us on Thursday with Ed Asner. And God yeah. willing, it will go smoothly. So, David, I'm going to say goodbye to you, but I will stay on the line. We'll talk afterwards. Guys, thank you for watching Billy Masters Live. I have been Billy Masters, and God knows this has been live. Um, 
Thank you for hanging in there with us. I appreciate it. And just remember, this show proves it more than anything else. If, if we're here, it's live. Bye, guys. Thank you.